and welcome to Sophie and Co. I'm Sophie Shevardnadze. The picture in Ukraine is murky, where calls for Europe compete with a leaning towards Russia. The U.S. has already said it's ready to support those protesting the government's rejection of integration with the EU. Is this a norm or a systemic error of the American foreign policy? For decades, America has been the leader of the world. But after years of complacency, crises, and expensive wars, is it struggling to maintain its position? With so much broken at home, is it worth the effort of trying to fix things abroad? Is the privilege of being the world's sole superpower slowly becoming a dangerous burden? And our guest today is legendary politician Pat Buchanan, a senior advisor to three American presidents who was once a candidate for the top job himself. Mr. Buchanan, it's such a pleasure to have you on our show tonight. Welcome. Delighted to be here, Sophie. So we're just going to start with the latest news. John McCain promised to support Ukrainians in their political stand against the government. Is that helpful for Ukraine? Well, my feeling is that Senator McCain, whom I respect, I had no business in the Ukraine. This is a decision by the Ukrainian people and the Ukrainian government as to whether they want to orient toward the Russian Customs Union or toward the European Economic Union. And I don't think that's an issue in which the United States has any right to be involved. It's a decision for the Ukrainians, as I said. And Senator McCain being there would be a little bit like President Putin being in Canada during the NAFTA debate and telling the Canadians not to sign. So I think the Ukrainians should make this decision themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, there are talks about sanctions the U.S. could use against the Ukrainian government. What are they? Is that action warranted? I don't think any action against the Ukraine is warranted, no matter what decision it makes. And this is a decision, again, for the Ukrainian government and the Ukrainian people. It has nothing to do with the vital interests of the United States. And I would be opposed to my own government, my own country, imposing sanctions on the Ukrainian government and people for a decision which is their sovereign right. So, and I don't think the Congress of the United States would, would go along with sanctions. I find that hard to believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like you said, uh, this is a choice that Ukrainian people should make themselves. And there is no one opinion on what path Ukraine should choose. In your opinion, what do you think can help them figure things out at this point? Well, I think the Ukrainians ought to decide what really is in their own best interest. I know a bit about the Ukraine. I was there in, back in 19... Uh, way back in the Nixon administration, before Richard Nixon in 1971. And I know that the eastern Ukraine, for example, is very much oriented toward Russia, and the western Ukraine is somewhat oriented toward the old Habsburg Empire. So it's a country that is really, uh, that is really a mixture. But again, this is a decision a democratic country ought to make for itself. And it is not the business of the United States to determine which way they should orient their economy. Mm -hmm. Well, what do you think about the money thrown at promoting democracy around the world, which also includes support and funding of color revolutions? Is it money well spent? I mean, some would argue that democracy actually happened in those countries that revolutions took place in. What do you think? Well, my view is that many of the, the, the National Endowment for Democracy and its assorted and associated agencies these were Cold War institutions. They were created in the Reagan administration. I was in the White House. And we were trying to orient countries more toward the West as the Soviet Union was trying to reorient them toward its camp in the Cold War. But with the Cold War over, in my judgment, I think these are counterproductive. I mean, interfering in the internal affairs of foreign countries to reorient their foreign policy or their government toward the United States, I don't think is justified unless there is some imminent threat to our own country. And I don't see that. And I have argued, basically, for the abolition of these kinds of agencies that interfere in the internal affairs of foreign nations. I think it's counterproductive. I think we create more enemies than we do friends when we involve ourselves in these so-called color-coded revolutions. Many of them have been overturned 
uh, since the uh, since the United States was sub rosa engaged in them, and so again, I would uh, I would say if, if the common turn has been shut down, then they ought to shut down some of these agencies in the United States. But I'm not in uh, I'm not in office anymore, and I'm not advising presidents anymore. Oh, what a pity that you're not inviting you're not advising presidents anymore. But since we're starting talking about Ukraine. Would you classify the U.S. actions in Ukraine right now as interference in internal affairs of a foreign country? And do you, you generally find that Washington has a real understanding of places it interferes in? Well, I don't know that you can say Washington is interfering per se. The, the, but the, I don't think the U.S. government, the, the Under Secretary of State, should have gone there and gotten into a rally in the middle of Kiev. I don't think Senator McCain should have gone there and been in a rally in the middle of Kiev and, and accused Russia of interfering in the internal affairs of Ukraine when he himself is doing exactly that. So I don't think that is helpful. Again, this is an issue uh, that really does not involve the United States of America. I can understand the European Union going to the Ukraine and arguing their case. I can understand Mr. Putin. You know, inviting the president of Ukraine to Russia to argue his case. I just don't know what America's vital interest or America's interest is in this decision, which belongs to the Ukrainian people and the Ukrainian government. And again, I'm sure some people welcome Senator McCain, but I think doing this really enhances and uh, and underscores the reputation, unfortunate, of the United States for interfering in people's affairs all over the world when there's no necessity. Or no right to do so. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, if people are out in the streets demanding an end to corruption, more transparency, respect for human rights, I mean, surely the United States is helpful to them, no? Well, I think they ought to do that. Uh, and I mean, they have a perfect right to demonstrate. They have a perfect right to demonstrate against their government. They have a perfect right to say, we don't want to orient toward Russia. We would like to be part of the European Union. That's the right of the Ukrainian people, and we would certainly, from the outside, support that right. But the question is not whether we support that right, which we do, but whether we ought to get in the middle of the argument. And that's what I'm saying is it isn't our quarrel. It isn't our argument. But uh, do the people of the Ukraine, would I like to see them have a right to have peaceful demonstrations, whether they're for or against uh, the Russian Customs Union? That's fine. But also, you know what a lot of people are thinking. Uh, I mean, the U.S. has enough troubles inside its borders, hasn't it? I mean, can it really afford <laughs> at this point to send undersecretaries and senators to foreign countries to support them for whatever reason? Well, I, th I think the senators went on his own, and I think they probably pay their own way. But I agree with you that the I don't think the undersecretary of state should be in demonstrations or should be vocal inside foreign countries about decisions they make which don't affect our national security and merely a, are about a choice which, as I say, belongs to the Ukraine alone. Mm -hmm. Now, you advocate curtailing U.S. interventions around the globe, but aren't they about security for Washington? Is it better to sponsor or fight a small-scale war far away than let things play out on their own and face a big problem on your doorstep later? My view is with regard, now that the Cold War is over, my view is the United States ought not to use its military force unless it's authorized by the Congress of the United States, unless the vital interests of the United States are imperiled in some way or other, and unless the American people are united over this intervention. As you may know, uh, I was against the Iraq War. Uh, when President George W. Bush took us to the Iraq War. Well, I favored the intervention in Afghanistan after the massacre of 9-11. I did not believe the United States should stay in Afghanistan and try to reform and remake that country according to our ideas and our ideals. I thought that was a, a, a bridge too far for the United States. I've opposed intervention in Syria, because I'm not an admirer of the regime there, but no vital interest to the United States was threatened in that civil war. So in each of those cases, and, and frankly, uh, since the Cold War ended, I have been against uh, most of the American interventions, because I didn't see them 
as directly related to the vital interest of my country. Nothing in my country was threatened. Our people were not threatened. And so I, and I don't think we ought to be out trying to remake the world in our image. It's an impossibility. As a great scholar said once, the Constitution of the United States is not for export. But you've also said that United States and the West will collapse in the same way Rome did from uncontrolled multiculturalism. Do you not believe in the positive effects of globalization? Uh, well, there's, there's no doubt that globalization has some tremendously positive aspects to it and consequences from it. I think that the fact that the Chinese people, for example, uh, where I visited China with Richard Nixon at his opening to China, I was part of that delegation. Uh, it was a deeply repressed country. Uh, poverty was pandemic. It was a dreary, as dreary a place as I've ever seen. And I think globalization is in large part responsible for the enormous buildup of China, the fact that there's widespread wealth in China, there's enormous production, it has grown at 10%, 12%, 8% a year for 20, 25 years. That's a good thing. My concern about globalization is the American economy, America was the most productive nation in the world, a tremendous manufacturing power. When I ran for president in 1992, I said, if we go into these trade treaties and free trade policies, the United States will lose its manufacturing base. It will disappear. It will be exported, and that's exactly what's happened. In the first decade of the 21st century, 50,000 American factories disappeared and 6 million manufacturing jobs disappeared. One in every three we had. So I think when you had an economy as advanced as the United States, put American workers in direct competition with Chinese workers who were then making $1 an hour or $2 an hour was deeply damaging to our country, even if it was beneficial to the People's Republic of China. All right, we'll be back with former U.S. presidential advisor Pat Buchanan to talk about the Syrian puzzle and the American involvement. Stay with us, folks. An undercover team of journalists trying to release WikiLeaks documents. It's about uh, how the United States is trying to uh, uh, make uh, the local media more pro-American. They encounter fear, ignorance, and pressure. What country blocks the way to information freedom? Media Stand on RT. Wealthy British scion, Zach Markets, finance, scandal. Find out what's really happening to the global economy with Max Kaiser for a no-holds-barred look at the global financial headlines. Tune in to Kaiser Report on RT. Right from the scene. First-rate news and eye-gripping pictures. On our reporter's Twitter and Instagram. To be in the know, follow us online. Did you know the press is the only industry specifically mentioned in the Constitution? That's because a free and open press is critical to our democracy. Strike alpha. Roll alpha. In fact, the single biggest threat facing our nation today is the corporate takeover of our government and our press. 
We've been hijacked by a handful of powerful transnational corporations that will profit by destroying what our founding fathers once built up. I'm Tom Hartman, and on this show, we reveal the big picture of what's actually going on in the world. We go beyond identifying the problem. We try to fix it. Rational debate and a real discussion of the critical issues facing America. Stand by on camera. Go. Ready to join the movement? Then welcome to the big picture. Former U.S. presidential advisor Pat Buchanan, great to have you back. Where do you see rising civilization? Who will take over the superpower role, in your opinion? Well, I think the, uh, the ri clearly the rising power and the potential superpower of the world, I think, is China, given the enormous size of the country, its extraordinary growth rate, uh, its population, which is 1.4 billion people. I think, uh, and, and its tremendous growing power and its assertiveness, I think China is the, is the rising superpower of the world. Uh, but let me ask you this. Does the world even need someone to fill the superpower shoes at all? Aren't we all about being multipolar at this point? Well, I don't think it's the choice of us. Uh, great nations that, that rise up invariably seek a place in the sun that is unique and that is different and that is above all others. It is natural and people take to this. It is part of human nature and I think the Chinese see themselves as the future dominant power of the Western Pacific, then of the Eurasian subcontinent and then of the world. But if we talk about the oil producing countries, not the superpowers, just the oil producing countries, and they're obviously very strong politically because of their resources. Well, they have a problem with human rights and America does nothing about it, like in Bahrain or Saudi Arabia. Why is the American public okay with that? Well, it's the, uh, it's the old question I and mean, the old point is uh, we're more tolerant of the mistakes and errors of our friends when we are those of our adversaries. There's no doubt about it. Is there something of a double standard in powers dealing with their friends, uh, like the Saudis and like the Gulf Arabs and the others and how they treat minorities and how they treat women, uh, than we are of some other countries like Russia, for example, with which we have something now of an adversarial relationship? There's no doubt your criticism is justified. It's exactly right. I wouldn't deny it. I mean, in Bahrain, uh, the Shia are the minority and they rose up peacefully uh, and they were put down by our friends. And so what the United States does in cases like that is usually tries quietly to work with these countries rather than gets in their face, which we tend to do with adversaries. Yeah, because the second question, of course, arises that if the U.S. can find common ground with absolute monarchs like the Saudis or the Bahrainis, why couldn't it do the same with strongmen like Assad? I mean, what is the campaign against Assad actually all about, in your opinion? Well, now with Assad, I mean, you might recall some of the, I believe it was Secretary of State Clinton and some others, when Assad, before the Civil War began, were talking about him as, quote, a reformer, and they were trying to get along with him. But now that this Civil War has broken out, and it is an appalling civil war, the atrocities and deaths and killing on both sides. Assad has been completely demonized in the United States so that you cannot associate him. And, but there's no doubt that some of those rebel groups, the al-Nusra Front and others, are engaged in terrorist atrocities of their own executions and, and murders and all the rest. And so, uh, you know, uh, but, you know, but there's no doubt that what's going on in Syria now is far more serious than what is going on in Bahrain. But how do you see the Syrian scenario play out at the end? What's your take on that? What's going to happen? I, I think it's, um, 
I don't think it's good. I think the, the Islamists are growing stronger. The so-called Free Syrian Army and the others who are associated with the Americans, those rebels are growing weak, relatively weaker. And I see the, the Islamist elements setting aside parts of Syria themselves and eliminating all opposition there. I think that it's hard to see how the war ends well in this sense. I think Assad could, could win something of a victory, but it's hard for me to see him driving out the Islamists from where they are really totally encamped. So what I think you could see is a sort of a, what's happened in Iraq after we went in there. You see the Kurdish parts breaking away, gaining more autonomy and independence. And the Islamists, I think, setting up their own sanctuaries along that Turkish border and in the north, and Assad in the south, southwest and over to the coast. And I think you could see sort of a de facto partition again, like we see right now in Iraq. And, and I don't think it's going to be good news for anyone. Well, what do you think about Obama's handling the Iranian issue? Is he doing the right thing? I mean, some people are talking about a possible thaw in a relationship right now. Is he handling it in the right way? I think President... I credit both Secretary of State Kerry, whom I've been a critic of, and President Obama, whom I criticized. I think they are doing the right thing. Uh, and, you know, I don't, I'm not a very hopeful person, but I'm inclined to think a deal can be done with the Iranians where they not only stop short of an atomic bomb, but st are st stop, their program is stopped a year or two short of the ability, even if they determined to build a bomb, stopped a year or two short of that ability. And I think it can be done because I think and when the Ayatollah says we've sworn off nuclear weapons, I think the Iranians must look at that Middle East and say, you know, what do we gain if we build an atom bomb? If we get an atom bomb, then the Israelis will put their nuclear arsenal on a hair trigger. The Saudis will get atom bombs from the Pakistanis. The Turks won't let us be the only nuclear power in this region. They will build a bomb. The Egyptians might have a bomb. The Americans will have all their warships, some of them armed with nuclear weapons, in our neighborhood. And if, God forbid, some atomic weapon went off anywhere in the world, everybody would blame us without looking at the evidence, and they would attack us. So what would an atom bomb for us do? Look at North Korea. They may be isolated. They are isolated. They are sanctioned. They are alone. They are despised. And look at China, which has come out and engaged the world, and look how they have done. And so I think the, if I were an Iranian, I would say, why don't we go the China road rather than the North Korea road? Because we're 80 million people, 85 million. We will become the dominant power in the Gulf naturally from natural growth and a peaceful Gulf. I mean, what nation is going to grow to be the dominant nation? The Americans threw out Saddam Hussein, and he was our enemy. And now we got a Shia government in mm -hmm. Baghdad. Well, since you brought up Saddam Hussein in Iraq, um, Iran is much stronger internally, a lot more unified than Iraq was in case of a conflict. It will not be a pushover, and everyone understands that. When the U.S. talks about a military option there, is it really ready for another tough engagement in the region? Is it even in the country's interest? Well, well, I don't think a war with Iran would be in the interest of the United States at all. Uh, and I hope and pray there is no conflict between the two countries. Uh, but I think you're somewhat mistaken when you say that Iran is more unified. If you take a look at Iran, the core center of Iran is Persian. But there are Baluch, Baluchistan in the south, Sistan, Baluchistan, there are secessionist movements there, there are Arabs in the southwest, there are Kurds up in the northeast, and there are Azeri in the north. I mean, at the end of World War II, Stalin, uh, Russia, the Red Army was in that area and had to be forced out of there. Any war between the United States and Iran, I think it would be a disaster for the world, a disaster for the world economy, but it would certainly be a disaster for Iran as well. There's no doubt that a country of 80 million is strong, at larger uh, three times as large as Iraq is it's not going to be any pushover for anyone, but I don't think anyone would imagine that the United States would send an army 
up to Tehran in the event of a conflict. Again, I wouldn't want to see a conflict, but in the event of a conflict, it would be all air, naval, and missiles. Mm -hmm. NSA surveillance is another huge topic, and that's not likely to end. We'll understand that. Mm -hmm. Do you think it is necessary? How will people counter it, or will they just give up? No, I think what's going to happen is, I don't, the court ruled, as you know, that's, um, you know, the court just, a court just ruled at the federal level, the district level, that the, uh, that the gathering all the information from telephone calls, emails, and the rest of it on everybody and putting it on file, that this was unconstitutional. But there's two more courts uh, to rule, and I don't think the Supreme Court will let that stand. But I do think this, there's probably going to be some reforms made of the NSA and its bugging and its all the rest of it, all the material it gathers, and which I think are basically done for the security of the United States. I don't think they're sitting around reading my emails. I don't know why they'd waste their time or listening to my phone calls. And I do think it's done for national security purposes, but I do think Congress will get in on the act. And I do think this, if you're talking about friendly countries, the idea of of listening to their conversations of friendly leaders as a matter of course, I don't think it's a very good idea because I don't think, first, we get anything out of it, and secondly, how can you call someone your friend when you're listening to his personal phone calls? So I think those types of things might be curtailed to a degree, but I think basically the program is not going to be, when you got that enormous capacity and that enormous ability, people almost always use it. Now, Mr. Buchanan, you yourself thought to become president of the United States. Do you believe in such a thing as clean politics? Isn't it all controlled by corporations now anyway? No, it's, I mean, there's no question about it that the big corporations, the giant corporations have tremendous power. They've got lobbying power in Washington, D.C., and, and they've got tremendous amounts of money. But, you know, uh, you know, they're not invincible. They're enormous power, but they are not invincible in national politics. And, uh, and I don't think the reason I lost uh, was the uh, corporate power. Mine was the, basically the Republican Party was basically at that point in 92 and 96 hostile to my ideas of economic nationalism, economic patriotism, and anti-interventionism, and some of those ideas. I think my ideas are probably more popular today than they were then, but you know, I don't think it is inevitable that someone, an outsider, can come in and win the presidency of the United States. I think certainly uh, Barack Obama uh, is an example of that. Clearly when you get the Democratic nomination, you get all of that support and power, the, the unions and all the rest. But I don't think just to say that big corporations are all powerful, they are enormously powerful. I think half of the biggest economic units in the world are companies, not countries. But I don't think they're united and I don't think they're invincible. Mr. Buchanan, it's been a delight to talk to you. Thank you very much for this interview. We wish you all the best in the upcoming new year of 2014 and hopefully we'll get to talk to you soon. That's all we have for now, guys. This was Pat Buchanan, former U.S. presidential advisor and a White House hopeful. See you next time here on Sophie Cove.